Hi again to everyone. Thank you for my registrants who have come for the full webinar and for anyone on YouTube who will be watching me for the first module of this very important uh, Advanced 360 course. This is part um, part number six, um, actually. This is part number six of this uh, critical piece of information. And um, what I'm looking at now is the vaccines benefits versus the risks. So it will be looking a broad view of uh, vaccines and explaining some of the characteristics that happen where they bring benefit. It's important to acknowledge the benefits they bring and to which cohorts as well as the longer medium and longer term risks that it can pose. And that's very also and very important for us to address. As usual, before I start, I just want to encourage people to continue to support uh, us. We really appreciate all the people. This is again about Humming Heroes. The link will be in the description. Um, inside the nose, almost nobody knows. And if anybody hasn't um, understood what this is about, this is a story um, type um, look at immunology in the sinuses and the way how nitric oxide is critical for the protection of the sinuses. And so this is now on Amazon. And guess what? We are number one. Yes, we are still at number one. And we remain at number one because of the support. So uh, this is the update, so to speak, of today, just now. So you can see here, Humming Heroes is still number one. Um, what we need is the reviews. Uh, we definitely, desperately need reviews. People read the book, give us your thoughts. Does it bring across the concepts in a way that makes sense and is able to impart knowledge, not just to younger people, but to adults, because we break it down, not just a story, but a relatively detailed explanation of the immunology. Additionally, what we're focused on today is the COVID-19 360 course. This is my comprehensive course, and it has this has taken a while to put together. So as you can see, these are all the modules that we've gone. We're over 30 modules, and we're going to be heading on beyond 40 modules, looking at every aspect of the disease to try and help people to understand it. Each one is about five to 10 minutes. I keep it generally very simple, lots of images, try and explain some of the science so that it makes sense. So if you are interested in that, please click on the link that will be in the description. It's not there right now, but it will be there very shortly. Right, so um, we'll be getting straight into the first module. And um, at the end of that module, if you're on YouTube, we'll say goodbye to you. But for the registrants, they will stay with me and we'll go through questions and try and make some clarifications to the information that is there. This is part six of our COVID-19 Advanced 360, where we're looking at the COVID vaccine benefits and risks. As with everything, one has to look carefully to try and understand who gains benefits and where are risks greatest. That part sadly hasn't been properly addressed or thoroughly addressed throughout the pandemic. And part of our job is to try and look at that and explain some of the unusual characteristics that would make us pause and look carefully at strategies going forward. As usual, with regards to our disclaimer, this is not medical advice that you use in place of your doctor. This is giving you information so that you can better be informed when you speak to your doctor. So if anyone is sick, they definitely need to get formal medical advice. Make sure that you are seen and detail the points that are your issues. Principle, COVID vaccines have to first suppress the immune system in order to get past the protective gate. This is a really, really important point. And this is going to be the baseline that I will take to help you to understand why we have some strange characteristics around vaccination that we don't see typically with regards to other vaccines. 
And so the critical point for everyone to always focus on when we speak about the COVID-19 pandemic is interferon. Once you have a good understanding about interferon and how it interacts with the virus, that will make a huge difference to explaining all the characteristics that we see. So at the end of this, the key learning objectives are going to be to just differentiate between the main types of COVID vaccines. We'll be looking at why vaccines can reduce the severity of COVID temporarily and also be associated with a slightly increased risk sometimes of infection. This is why it's circulating in highly vaccinated regions. We'll be looking at the association with long-haul disease. How could it trigger it? And also how mRNA vaccines can lead to spike protein immune tolerance. And that will be part of IgG4 as well. This was covered in a previous module, but I think it's important to address in this section. Now, when we think of vaccines, this is vaccines generally. And you have to think primarily the active ingredients in a vaccine, either the, va the viral or the bacterial antigens. They have lots of stabilizers in there so that it remains, um, it remains okay. Preservatives so that it can last for a period of time. There are always some trace components inside any vaccine. And depending, sometimes there are antibiotics to prevent contamination by bacteria. And the critical bit that oftentimes causes confusion is the adjuvants. And one of the longest used adjuvants is aluminum salts. Now, it's important to note that in the context of some of the newer vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, the lipid nanoparticle itself is the adjuvant. And essentially, an adjuvant is something that just keeps on triggering your immune system so that it continues to produce antibodies and keeps the immune system active to a very specific antigen. And that's the purpose of a vaccine, to train the immune system to always be on the lookout for it. And I think what we're learning is that that comes with significant benefits, yes, in terms of disease um, protection, but there are also risks that have to be taken into consideration. This is a general principle about what happens with regards to vaccinations and antibodies. You can see here that you have antibody levels on this one, and this one is here, here antibody affinity. That's two different aspects of what happens with the immune system. And you can see that at immunization one here, you get a rise in antibodies. It starts to fall off. Then there is immunization, um, the booster two, and then three. And so you'll then have elevated levels of IgG antibodies, which will gradually wane over time. And with some vaccines, they remain there long term. The other part of the story is to do with antibody affinity. And as you boost the immune system, it gets more and more focused on being effective at binding that specific antigen. So early on, it is not so focused, but as time goes by, it becomes more focused. And this antibody affinity is very critical in terms of vaccines. One of the problems is, therefore, that if you have too strong antibody affinity, kind of like what we have seen so far, and the virus mutates, that affinity can then lead to issues with the immune system being able to neutralize the virus. And so that's another problem that one has to be aware of. Here is just the mRNA technology. And the principles, again, quite basically are relatively straightforward. You have inside this lipid nanoparticle here, and these have these lipids on the outside. It's like the shell. And inside, you have the mRNA. And the mRNA has a specific coding. And then once it gets inside the cell, it will make spike protein. So it's not spike protein that's in the lipid nanoparticle. It's just the coding. It's almost the information that will allow it to make the spike protein. And so that's what then is injected in the body from the perspective of the mRNA technology, that's Moderna and Pfizer. When you compare it to the AstraZeneca, instead of what they would use a lipid nanoparticle, they used an adenovirus that was able to get inside cells. They've just created a shell where it has some of the functioning proteins in it, so it can then get into the cell, 
get into the nucleus of the cell and it has inside this again an mRNA uh, um, template of DNA that will then make spike protein. So that's the simplicity uh, of the concept. That's the difference between them. And you'll see in um, another slide here, this is just showing you a cell, just so that you have an understanding as to what we mean when we say the nucleus and so on. And this is the overall view of a cell. Most cells are typical like this. And what you will find is that inside the cytoplasm of the cell, there are lots of functioning parts like the peroxisome, mitochondria producing energy, ribosomes making proteins, Golgi apparatus making other proteins and combining them with lipids. So there's all this factory work going on inside the cytoplasm. And inside the nucleus, that's almost the central agency. That's where the DNA is located, and it is separated by a nuclear membrane. So when we speak about the cell, the simplicity or the way to look at it simply is just to break it down into a cell nucleus and a cell cytoplasm. And that's what we have here. All of this around here is the cytoplasm where the machinery of making protein uh, exists. And inside is the nucleus, usually where the information to make proteins is located. And that's the basic setup of a cell. And so the vaccines take advantage of this natural setup. What they then do is that when we look at the two different types of vaccine platforms for COVID vaccines, in terms of the AstraZeneca and GNJ, which use adenovirus, what they'll be doing is that this shell of the virus will be able to penetrate inside the cytoplasm and then it will go straight towards the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, it will then release the DNA, which will then be converted into RNA, which will then make spike proteins, which are then put on the surface of the cell and trigger the immune system. On the other hand, the Moderna, of Pfizer BioNTech um, L lipid nanoparticles, they penetrate the cytoplasm of the cell, and instead of going into the nucleus, they are able to make the proteins in the cytoplasm. So the mRNA, which normally would be converted from DNA into RNA, doesn't that step doesn't need to happen with the Moderna and the Pfizer BioNTech. That's theoretically one of the big advantages of mRNA technology because it allows faster changes to making the proteins that you want. Here is the problem. In order for this to work, you have to suppress interferon. So I've got here, this is the interferon guard. I've got him here. He's prevented from doing his security job. He's tied up and he's bound. Because if you want to be able to achieve that aim of making these proteins, he can't be working. This is a critical point. So here again, let's look at that. And this is the context that we have. For both of these, adenovirus going into the DNA, making this strange looking RNA um, molecule, which then makes abnormal um, proteins, which then trigger the immune system, this here is the lipid nanoparticle, again, producing mRNA. Normally, the interferon will be blocking this because it doesn't want a virus to be able to do this. But in the context of what we need to achieve with regards to the spike protein, part of the strategy is that you have to evade this interferon. And so this is critical to understand when I go on to the next uh, module and explain why we have this strange association between higher risk of infection with lower risk of severe disease. Once you understand interferon, it makes perfect sense. Again, just again, reinforcing the point so that you understand, this is the AstraZeneca JNJ adenovirus platform, it goes inside the nucleus, the DNA is made into RNA, it makes spike protein. The spike protein is then put on the surface of the cell, it is then picked up by the immune system. It then makes triggers these B cells or plasma cells to then produce lots of antibody, which can then target virus. And that's the aim of the system with regards to, that's the adenovirus platform. 
And again, conversely, you have with regards to the mRNA platform, similar principle, you have the lipid nanoparticles releasing the mRNA, the mRNA gets processed, produces spike protein, it's put on the surface, and again, it triggers the immune system, antigen presenting cell to trigger these plasma cells to produce antibodies and T cells and so on, so that immunity has then occurred from the vaccine. So that's the principle. But the most important point for one to grasp is that in order for this to work, you have to control interferon because interferon would block that process of taking a new or unusual mRNA that it doesn't recognize to make proteins. And that's part of the body's defense system against all viruses, not just coronaviruses, every virus, uh, influenza viruses, RSV viruses. That's the principle that occurs. So the point I want to make here is that COVID vaccines in order for them to be effective at producing an antibody and immune response, they actually have to first suppress the immune system in order to get stimulation of the immune system. The protective gate has to be pulled down in order for them to be beneficial. That has strengths and weaknesses, which we will cover in our next module. Great. Okay. That's the end of that module. I hope that made sense for um, people, for my YouTube audience. Thank you very much. Again, I remind you to support us on Humming Heroes. Please look out for the link below and help us to stay at number one. We're trying to educate the public about nitric oxide here. Um, and so we will again certainly be make, bringing you information in the near future. For the other webinar people, please just stay with me.